So it is Tuesday, my name is Philip DeFranco, and today we're having to do that same dance where today's Tuesday Philip DeFranco show is split into two parts. This, of course, is try to bypass YouTube's content rating system and algorithm. So you have part one, which is this video, which is actually less likely to be suppressed. And then in about two hours, if you come back to this channel, I'll have part two, or if you're watching this and it's already up, top link down below, or you can click right there. And that is where we're gonna be talking about a story that is far more likely to be suppressed here on YouTube, and so I wanna make sure we get the eyes in front of it. But that said, welcome back to the Philip DeFranco Show. Buckle up, hit that like button, and let's just jump into it. The first thing we're gonna talk about today is fake activism slash clout chasing. So, you know, people all over the country have been searching for ways to support the black community and call for justice since the killing of George Floyd, whether it be through protests, donations, difficult conversations about race, helping board up, helping clean up. But we've also witnessed some forms of activism that have been slammed as disingenuous and others that some feel might actually be hurting the cause. You know, there, there was a Jake Paul situation that a number of you asked me to talk about yesterday, but as time goes on, we've been seeing more and more examples. One of these examples that's been making its way online is the alleged conversation between two friends, which was screen grabbed from one of the person's close friends' Instagram story. In it, one allegedly discusses getting drunk and going to a protest, asking, is that like so dangerous? The other appears to respond, oh my God, I'm so down, followed by a let me find a riot outfit. Then we see an alleged Instagram photo of them actually at a protest. And once people saw that, the women were met with a ton of backlash since it appeared they didn't actually care about the movement and instead were going for the thrill and the photo op, with a woman who posted the photo eventually deleting her account. In one video that's been circulating online, a man seen photographing a white woman in front of a looted T-Mobile store and the person recording gasps. But the big one, the, the clip and the story that most people are focusing on. It's a video showing a woman posing with a drill and a worker as if she's helping board up a store with wood. She then thanks the actual worker and heads back into her Mercedes as someone off camera says, good job guys, BLM. Right, so a lot of people online have been describing that woman as an influencer, but it also appears that that's not the case. After some digging, many including New York Times reporter Taylor Lorenz actually identified her as Fiona Moriarty McLaughlin, with reports saying that she is a conservative political writer for the Washington Examiner. People also found her Twitter account, which she then set to private and later deleted, but not before someone screen grabbed a tweet that she previously wrote saying, as if vandalizing all the buildings in LA wasn't enough, Black Lives Matter has taken to the billboards as a crowd of rioters roars in approval. Also, kind of funny note regarding that billboard, the brand paying for it, Way, and it's hair care by hairstylist Jen Atkins. She actually posted that photo with the caption, I would have climbed up there myself, hashtag Black Lives Matter. And the official Twitter account for Jen Atkin hair actually quote tweeted, responded, to Fiona on Twitter but before her account was gone, saying, made our sign even better, and adding after the woman had been identified, oh my God, the fact that this is the same woman makes so much sense. But also, hey, we're, we're judging everything off of this clip. Maybe she actually boarded up all the other windows and she was like, okay, now it's you, it's you, you you finish it. Cause you know, that's that's the most likely way things went down. Right, so there was that part of this story, but also there, there's the movement that is Blackout Tuesday. So this protest was actually initially spearheaded by two black music executives by the name of Jamila Thomas and Brianna Ajimang. Their initiative is called The Show Must be paused and as part of it, members of the music industry committed to postponing new releases and temporarily suspending business operations. And they called it a day to take a beat for an honest, reflective, and productive conversation about what actions we need to collectively take to support the black community. And this is a really notable industry to thrust its support behind the black community because as the execs note, it benefits from the efforts, struggles, and successes of black people. Right? And so what we ended up seeing is that after several labels, streaming services, and artists supported the movement, it actually started to evolve. Others on social media began sharing images of black squares as a way to show solidarity with black victims of police brutality and racism. And this, at one point, was dubbed Blackout Tuesday, and you started seeing celebrities joining it, like Katy Perry, Tom Holland, Drake, other brands even trying to figure out their own ways to participate, with some like Rihanna's Fenty label suspending sales for the day. But uh, the problem here is, unlike the celebrities I just talked about, a lot of people are uploading these black squares using the hashtags BLM or Black Lives Matter, which is why we started to see some, including this Twitter user, say, this is counterproductive. Please understand what you're doing before you do it. Amplify black voices without silencing the movement. Here, some big names seem to agree. Actor Kumail Nanji Yanni, for instance, asking people to not use Black Lives Matter hashtags, saying it's pushing down important and relevant content, use hashtag Blackout Tuesday. And he was definitely not alone in getting that message out. Also, uh, another potential issue with the movement is that it's also being understood by some as a day to remain silent and not post online. So because of that, we saw people like Lil Nas X speaking out, writing on Twitter, I know y'all mean well, but, bro, saying stop posting for a day is the worst idea ever. I just really think this is the time to push as hard as ever. I don't think the movement has ever been this powerful. With him also warning about important posts being drowned out and asking whether it might be a better idea to instead post donation and petition links at the same time. Right, you had the likes of Chance the Rapper noting, do not black out the movement. Once again, he was not the only one here, and so concerns about Blackout Tuesday are starting to be heard. But yeah, that's where we are with this part of the story. It's why also throughout the day, you might see different versions of Blackout Tuesday. And personally, I think even with the confusion, I, I think ultimately it is a net 
good to raise awareness. Yeah. And that's where we are with this story right now. And of course, with any of the things that we just talked about, uh, I'd love to know your thoughts in those comments down below. But from that, I want to share some stuff I love today and today in also brought to you by Squarespace. Whether you need a domain, a website, an online store, a whatever, make it with Squarespace. Squarespace empowers people of all kinds to create their online web presence or launch their passion projects. And it's a place that so many people trust and where everyone can find and make a home. And it's easy to see why. There's nothing to install, patch, or upgrade ever. And creating a beautiful website with Squarespace all-in-one platform has never been so simple. It is extremely intuitive and easy to use. Also, it, it includes fantastic things that you usually don't think about until way after. Things like you get their award-winning marketing tools and analytics, and you can also get personalized support from their award-winning customer care team via email or live chat. Whatever you need, they're available 24-7 to help out. And so if you want to check this out, see why so many others love it, go ahead and start your free trial today over at squarespace.com slash fill. And when, not if, you realize you love it, make sure you enter in offer code fill to get 10% off your first purchase. And the first bit of awesome was now NASA giving us NASA astronauts arriving at the International Space Station. Of course, this coming off the heels of the successful SpaceX launch. If you're a fan of Twice, I'll give you some more and more. We had Ted Ed giving us When Is a Pandemic Over? We also had Tom Scott putting out The Worst Typo I Ever Made. And finally, we had Daniel Thrasher giving us 13 micro songs to boost your mood. And if you want to see the full versions of everything I just shared, the secret link of the day, really anything at all, links as always are in the description down below. And then let's talk about this story blowing up around Leah Michelle. You know, she's best known for her role on Glee, but also appeared in other TV shows like Scream Queens and the mayor. And all of this started when she posted a tweet saying, George Floyd did not deserve this. This was not an isolated incident and it must end hashtag Black Lives Matter. Right, it's a, a similar statement to what a lot of people are putting out right now, but uh, hers did not go over well. And that's because last night, Samantha Marie Ware, who starred with Leah on Glee in season six, shared this tweet, writing, remember when you made my first television gig a living hell? Cause I'll never forget. I believe you told everyone that if you had the opportunity, you would shit in my wig, amongst other traumatic microaggressions that made me question a career in Hollywood. And then we ended up seeing a number of Leah's other co stars kind of hopping on and either agreeing or just, uh, you know, you had uh, Amber Riley, who was also on Glee, sending a tweet of a, a gif of her sipping from a coffee mug. Alex Newell, who also was on the show for several years, shared a tweet saying, get her Jade. Also had musician and actor Dabier, who appeared on one episode of Glee saying, girl, you wouldn't let me sit at the table with the other cast members because I quote, didn't belong there. Fuck you, Leah. And then adding, I try to bring good vibes and create content for people to laugh and enjoy. Seeing her message brought back bad memories of being less than on set of Glee. Ain't gonna stand for her being fake like she cares. You also had people who worked with her on other projects responding. Yvette Nicole Brown, who you might know best from Community, but also worked with Leah on The Mayor, responded to Samantha's tweet saying, I felt every one of those capital letters. And she actually posted a good amount in response to this, though specifically not calling Leah out on any behavior, kind of intentionally leaving some of her thoughts and experiences up in the air. But also at one point adding, every person on a set matters. Every person on a set deserves respect. And it is the responsibility of every series regular to make every person who visits their home feel welcome. This dismissive attitude is what's wrong in Hollywood and the world. And as far as the other side of this story, there's really not much to say right now. Leah has not commented on or responded to any of this. And so that's where we are with this story. And I guess the question I could connect to this story is, uh, one, for those of you who are fans of Glee or Leah Michelle or, or anything, uh, does this news surprise you? And two, do you think this is kind of just a random story or do you see it as kind of uh, a distant ripple in the pond that has had a, a rock thrown in it right now? And then an update to the George Floyd story that we haven't gotten to yet. We, we need to talk about the autopsy or rather autopsies. There are now two that we're seeing, right? The, the first one was conducted last week, notably was performed by the Hennepin County Medical Examiner's Office. And in a preliminary report released last Friday in a charging document for Derek Chauvin, we saw the office say that the autopsy, quote, revealed no physical findings that support a diagnosis of traumatic asphyxia or strangulation. Mr. Floyd had underlying health conditions, including coronary artery disease and hypertensive heart disease. The combined effect of Mr. Floyd being restrained by the police, his underlying health conditions, and any potential intoxicants in his system likely contributed to his death. Right, so that report basically saying that Floyd hadn't specifically been choked to death, but that Chavin pinning him down did contribute to his death. However, that preliminary report failed to satisfy a lot of people. In fact, it even seemed to stoke another level to the outrage that we were already seeing. Right, and so with this, you had a ton of people calling for another autopsy, which we actually ultimately saw. Because pretty much immediately following this report's release, Floyd's family announced that they were pursuing a second independent autopsy. And alongside that, you also had Floyd's family saying that they were seeking to raise Chavin's murder charge from third degree to first degree. Now, we'll get to that second autopsy in a moment, but I wanted to mention yesterday, we did actually see the medical examiner's office release its full report. And in that, you had the office listing Floyd's cause of death as cardiopulmonary arrest, complicating law enforcement subdual restraint and neck compression. Right, cardiac arrest, basically saying that his heart stopped beating and that among other significant conditions listed in the report were Floyd's pre-existing artery and heart diseases, as well as fentanyl intoxication and recent methamphetamine use. Though the report doesn't go into detail about how much was actually in his system or how they may have 
actually contributed to his death. But very notably here, that report still concludes that Floyd died by homicide. Though one thing I do want to note with this is you also had that office saying, manner of death is not a legal determination of culpability or intent and should not be used to usurp the judicial process. Such decisions are outside the scope of the medical examiner's role or authority. Now that said, let's talk about the second autopsy because preliminary findings for it were also released yesterday. And while it also ultimately concludes that Floyd died by homicide, its reasoning here is actually a bit different. Okay, so this autopsy was conducted by former New York City Chief Medical Examiner Michael Baden and the University of Michigan's Alicia Wilson. And here, if Baden's name sounds familiar, that's actually because he previously performed autopsies on Eric Garner and Michael Brown. But that said, in this report, Baden and Wilson determined that Floyd actually died of asphyxiation from sustained pressure after being pinned down by his neck and back. Baden also saying that he found hemorrhaging around Floyd's right carotid artery that impeded blood flow to the brain. And notably here, Baden also said, The compressive pressure of the neck and back are not seen at autopsy because the pressure has been re released by the time the body comes to the medical examiner's office. It can only be seen uh, serious compressive pressure on the neck and, and uh, back can only be seen while the pressure is being applied or when, as in this instance, it is captured on video. Also, contrary to what we saw in that first autopsy, Baden said that no underlying medical condition caused or contributed to Floyd's death, with Baden actually adding that Floyd was in good health. And so following this, you had the family's lawyer, Ben Crump, saying, Essentially, George died because he needed a breath. For George Floyd, the ambulance was his hearse. Beyond question, he would be alive today if not for the pressure applied to his neck by fired officer Derek Chauvin and the strain on his body from the two additional officers kneeing him in his back. Right, and here, this, this is actually an important note that, that Crump focused on the fact that the autopsy determined that Floyd died not just because of his neck, but also the pressure to his back. Right, so Crump is using that to further call for the arrest of the other three officers that were involved, two of which can be seen in a video sitting on Floyd's back with Chavin. But ultimately, that is where we are with this aspect of the story now. And, and so with it, of course, I do pass a question off to you. What are your thoughts around this? Are you confused? Do you believe one over the other? Yes, no, why? Let me know. And that is it for today's show, except for part two, which will be uploaded on this channel in about two hours, or may in fact be up right now. So maybe just go to youtube.com slash defranco. Hey, as always, thanks for watching, hitting that like button on this video, being a part of that conversation down below. Also, if you're new here, hit that subscribe button. Also, even if you're already subscribed, make sure you have that bell tapped so it looks like this. It makes it more likely you won't miss these daily videos. Also, if you missed either part of yesterday's show, we have part one and part two right here. You can click or tap right now. But with that said, of course, as always, my name's Philip DeFranco. You've just been filled in. I love yo faces and I'll see you tomorrow. I hope you like the video. Subscribe if you like it.